The subject of my talk was changed by Mark just now, because I actually wasn't going to talk about computational chemistry. Um, but actually, it's a good way to introduce. I was uh, here at ELSI for a couple years as a research scientist, and now I'm at a private company in Tokyo working on machine learning and artificial intelligence. And one of the things I found to my surprise, I still come to LC twice a week, and all of these projects have opened up um, because of the stuff that I'm doing now in AI. It's actually quite applicable to analyzing the kind of data that, uh, for example, Elizabeth was talking about in her talk. So we have a few limited observations of exoplanets, and we want to know more about them. And it turns out some of the most um, the recently developed techniques in artificial intelligence can actually help answer that. It's everywhere now. Um, so we had this sort of dead period in artificial intelligence where you didn't really hear much about it anymore. And now in the last three years or so, it's been uh, completely expanding. It's everywhere. The news covers it. Uh, Companies are now using it for business purposes. It's used in industry. It's, uh, it has a lot of implications for things like privacy and society because governments apply it as well. Um, but the kind of artificial intelligence that people are working on now, that people are developing now, this sort of new uh, artificial intelligence is very different than the sort of old style, which is more like what you probably would have read about in science fiction novels. So. The mental image of uh, machine intelligence had this sort of idea that it's logical and it, it works by a deduction. Um, machines can't understand emotion, but they can understand how truth kind of applies, and they can make very, very wide-ranging uh, sort of plans. And actually, ironically, uh, people tried to build that um, in the 60s, and it didn't really work. It worked kind of in a local way, but it was very fragile. So when you try to have it deal with raw data, with images from a camera, rather than something constructed and already put into shape by a human practitioner, it just would suddenly break. Um, as a result of this, people stopped funding AI research, uh, by and large, in the 70s. And at the same time, there were techniques still being used in industry and business that did what we would just call statistics. So they just analyzed data. They tried to extract correlations from data and got more and more sophisticated with that. At a recent point, around 2000, those techniques really came into their own. And with the increase in computing power, some of the old techniques that were seen as more of an actual dedicated model of the brain or artificial intelligence kind of thing ended up almost being merged with these business techniques and these statistical techniques that had been steadily growing throughout the sort of dead zone of AI in the 70s. And so now we have something that's very different than the science fiction image of a kind of a, a logical deductive robot. So in the old style of AI, the idea is to explicitly represent human knowledge and then look at how human knowledge interacts. So you have a few statements that you know are true, and you have a few rules of how statements can be combined with each other. And through that, you generate everything that's true, or everything that you could possibly know is true. And that was sort of the, the mental image of what intelligence was like. Um, and the problem is this requires a lot of work from humans to set the thing up in a way that those rules are going to let the system go anywhere other than what was imagined. So even though this could, in principle, extrapolate very far, in practice, it was brittle. If you change things a little bit, then suddenly these rules don't apply. It doesn't really help you anymore. Um, the new approach basically is very hands-off. Human uh, practitioners of it try not to put anything in, if at all possible. Let the machine figure out what it can from raw data. And the kind of message of this is the data itself contains almost uh, a way to figure out how to process it if you just have enough data and you use robust enough techniques. Um, the result is you have a machine that almost acts like human intuition. It can make guesses. The guesses are generally correct, or they're more correct than chance. But at the same time, it's really hard for the machine to explain, why is this right? Why do I think this? Uh, and that makes it very challenging for humans to interact with and to understand when things are going wrong. So I want to kind of explain what this is concretely. One of the, uh, the most common techniques now is using neural networks. And these are all, all sorts of different forms. So this is just a sort of a prototype, a toy, toy example. 
And there's, you have some input to the network, in this case, an image of my cat. That input is encoded in numbers, so pixel values, things like that. And those numbers are then pushed through a network of successive computations. So I start with these inputs. In the next layer, they become some new numbers. In the next layer, they become some new numbers, and so on. Each of these layers is related to each other by a mathematical operation, which I've defined. And I've put some kind of unknown values into that operation. In this case, these are these, uh, these weights. So the way that the red layer goes to the green layer is specified by these weights. And those weights will change in order to make the predictions better. So right now, this network is very bad. It thinks this is a dog, 70% chance. But since I know how I got those numbers, I can change the network to make it so that when shown the same thing, now it's going to say cat. And I can figure out by going back through the network, by propagating those errors backwards through the same calculation I've just done, I can figure out how each of those weights should change just a little bit to make it a little bit less mistaken on this one case. And then in the future, this is exaggerated, but the next time I run it, now it thinks probably a cat. In practice, if I do this on one image, and if I just do this once, uh, the next cat may be a black cat. It didn't help. But if I do this on 100 million cats, and I do it over and over and over, I gradually remove all of the ways that the network makes mistakes, at least as covered by the data that I've given it. But at the end of this, it can't tell me why it thinks this is a cat. So another property of these is that they're very good at filling in gaps in uh, between what it's shown. So if I show it a black cat and a gray cat and an orange cat and so on, it can kind of figure out what's between them. But if I show it a very different kind of cat, instead of showing a, you know, a house cat, I show it a cheetah, then it's hopeless. It's never seen anything like it. It doesn't know how to fix the errors that it has built into it about how to process a cheetah. So it's very good at, at this sort of inside of what it sees, but outside of what it sees, like here, I've taken one of these things and I've just trained it on the blue data. Um, in between, it's fine. Outside, it doesn't extrapolate at all. It doesn't understand this pattern should be repeated over and over and over, uh, which means that in the end of the day, this kind of AI is very strictly limited by the quality of the data that it can be provided. It can't become infinitely good just sitting in a room. It has to constantly be receiving some kind of feedback and information from its environment, and that controls what happens. Google um, recently did a study where they took all of the images from YouTube and uh, all these photo sharing sites and things like that, made a data set with 300 million images, and that still performed noticeably better than the best AI people could generate with 100 million images, with 10 million images. And there's just a simple logarithmic scaling of performance with the amount of data. So these things are very data bottlenecked. That determines how good the thing you get is going to be. All right, what's going on inside of the network? Uh, they're hard to interpret, but they're not impossible. The nice thing about having something on a computer is we can cut it open and see what's going on exactly. And we can change something a little bit and see how that changes. And the, sort of image that has uh, emerged from studying these things empirically is that what they really do is they filter out irrelevant information. So in that first layer, they keep as much as they can. But then the next layer down, they've discarded a few things that ended up not being very constructive to the question that was being asked. And the next layer down, they discard a bit more and a bit more. And at the end, the only information that exists in the network at the very last layer is what the network needs to answer the questions it's been asked. But interestingly, at the top, at the very first layer, it throws out things that are just generally not useful. So in this case, um, this is a network that's trained to identify the age and gender of a face. And at the top layer, you can see it can still see uh, the rims of my glasses. It can see my mouth, uh, all of these different things are the activations of one neuron in the network. And I've just picked seven, or seven neurons for that layer to visualize, but there's 128 of them, I think. The way that it's actually detecting these, if I actually look at it, it finds very general features of images that are robust, like edges, uh, circles, corners, things like that. But it's not very responsive to, say, a noise pattern. 
And that's because even at the most simple level, ignoring noise is just a generally good strategy to being able to answer the question deeper in the network. But as I go further and further down, I stop being able to actually reconstruct some of these features anymore. I have almost lost my glasses here. Here, they're pretty much gone. Here, I can't even see my face anymore. There's just some uh, statistical correlations that the network has held on to that are informative about age and gender. So networks are generalized. That is, they, they can work on things that they haven't seen because they're throwing away all of the distracting factors that actually make those things different. By the end of the network, all of these faces are basically the same face as long as they have the same age and gender. So you can ask, what do these things actually know? If a network can classify something, does that mean it understands what it is? There's a technique for actually um, asking the network or uh, asking it to reconstruct an input that would convince it that this is this kind of class. So in this case, for example, um, this is a network that's uh, freely available. People trained on a very large data set called ImageNet. And it has a 1,000 different objects that it knows how to recognize. I picked three that I thought would be very uh, visually distinctive, and I generated um, these three reconstructions. This is what it thinks an image that would convince it it's a Pekingese dog. And you can see there's some eyes and maybe some of the shape of the face, but it's very abstract. Um, this is a flamingo, uh, and you can see the kind of the bird shape and some wings and the color patterns of a flamingo. But again, it's not like a flamingo situated in a realistic background. It's not a full image. It's just bits of the idea of a flamingo that are relevant to it, that it thinks are indicative. And uh, the same for a snake, where you can see scales. You can see the kind of it looks like the belly scales and an eye and maybe the face. All right. So. In the, in the case of that reconstruction, that's what the network knows, but it doesn't know that it knows. The network has no sort of introspective process where it queries itself. It just does things. It's like um, when, you, when you catch a ball, you don't have time to think about what are you going to do. You just do it. And then you can look at it after the fact and say, this is what it felt like to catch a ball. The network I described d didn't have that mechanism. It's just, a, it's just like your visual system or something very reflexive. However, we can intentionally design networks that have this kind of reflective mechanism or this kind of introspective mechanism. Um, one of the things that lets us do this, we have a large amount of data available to us in our senses all the time, but we can only pay attention to a little bit. And we direct that attention to pay attention to what's to, to look at or to only take the data that's relevant to what we're trying to do. The network that's static that I described before all of that stuff is frozen in. It says, I'm going to discard this information at this layer. That's how I am. But you can make it dynamic instead. You can ask the network to direct what it discards based on the current circumstances. And this kind of attentional model is uh, actually really good for processing human language. So the, um, the newest uh, Google state-of-the-art machine translation uses attention to model the relationship between words in a sentence. And you can train it on about 10,000 times less uh, computer cycles than if you do one that doesn't have this kind of attention mechanism. So um, this makes a really big difference to the performance of this kind of, uh, of, this kind of technology. Um, all of what I've been talking about is networks that essentially get rid of information. They discard what they don't care about. You might ask, well, if I want to make something that creates new information, if I want a creative AI, could I do that? And there's a technique that came out a few years ago called generative adversarial networks. The technique here is that you have two networks that interact with each other, and they essentially fight to try to fool each other. One network produces a fake image, and the other network tries to learn how to tell the difference between reality and fake images. And as a result, they sort of explore the space of images to figure out what makes an image realistic. And you can get very nice results, uh, even with a very small amount of data. For instance, this, these are all fake. All of these butterflies are generated by the generative part of the network from a noise pattern. Um, however, the generator and discriminator were trained on a data set uh, of, I think it's 3,000. Uh, 3,000 butterfly images that look very similar to this, but are different in detail. As a result of this, uh, the model that the generator learns allows us to even generate 
uh, intervening butterflies. We can generate a butterfly halfway between two species or halfway between two genders, a butterfly halfway between front and back. Very strange things like that that don't exist in the world, but that the understanding that the machine has developed allows it to imagine. Another uh, interesting thing about this is once you have these creative machines, well, what's the relationship between that and human artists? So you could just try to let the machine do everything, but a more sort of interesting or uh, uh, useful way to go about this is to ask what would a human artist do when given access to the machine? The nice thing about this kind of technique is you can give it cues. You can say, I want you to draw something that fits within a certain outline. So this is something called picks to picks, and I drew this very bad cat, and it generated this. It filled in the details. Or if I give it something that's not a cat, it still tries to make it into something like a cat. It takes my cue, and then it's just another tool I can use, like a paintbrush. Um, this is an example of a piece of software. You can download this. Uh, it involves installing quite a lot of stuff, unfortunately. but. Um, it understands mountains, at least to some degree, and it can take cues of the color of the sky or the grass, things like that, and generate a mountain responding to your, uh, to your input. All of this stuff is kind of data processing still, even the generative stuff. Um, another place that people try to use artificial intelligence is to drive behaviors. So a big example of this is self-driving cars. You want the machine to control the motion of the vehicle. It has to choose where to go. It has to choose how to respond to a situation. It has to generate actions, not just correctly classify a perceptual input. And this creates a really big problem. When I want to classify perceptual input, I can be like Google and collect 300 million images independent of any artificial intelligence development. I can just gather as much data as I want, and I'll get a very good AI out of that. If I want something that's actually taking action, it needs to know what its actions would do. So if I want to understand how to make a safe self-driving car that doesn't, or that can, say, recover from a near crash situation, like if it starts to swerve off the road, I want it to be able to recover, I need to collect data of that car swerving off the road because these things can only interpolate. So they need to have some experience of the situations they're likely to deal with or that you want them to behave competently in. And that means for this kind of AI right now, it's very far behind the sort of perceptual AI because of this data limit, because you actually need to engage the AI in those real world control uh, situations in order for it to actually have what it needs to learn. All right. so. In conclusion, the, the main thing about modern AI compared to the sort of science fiction images, it's all experience driven, it's all very intuitive, it's essentially learning from doing a massive statistical analysis of a lifetime or many human lifetimes worth of uh, data that it's given. But it doesn't actually work by deduction, it doesn't work by following into some kind of extrapolatory story or what we would generally call understanding. Um, the nice thing about this setup is that it means you don't actually have to understand how to do the task you want to teach it. You just have to have a lot of examples. And there's a lot of flexibility in that you can set up the network with very complicated structures and let it take care of itself. Given the data and given a network, the optimization process of fixing all the small errors bit by bit will take it to some kind of functional state. And you don't actually have to understand how it's doing it at the end. You just have to set up a circumstance where if it works, you know it and you get what you want. However, because it can't extrapolate, this puts a really strong limit on where we can easily use it versus where we might like to use it, but it's not really going to give us what we want. If we want to do things in very new situations, that's a really big problem right now. And learning how to make an actual functional extrapolative AI, I think right now is, is one of the key problems. And the data requirements pose certain limits on where and when you can actually use these technologies. So thank you.